Hello and welcome to another episode of the Secular Buddhism Podcast. This is episode number 73. I'm your host, Noah Rochetta, and today I'm talking about what moves us, the five core social motives. Again, before I jump into the topic of the podcast, I want to remind you of the Dalai Lama's advice. Do not use what you learn from Buddhism to be a Buddhist. Use it to be a better whatever you already are. This has always been a key message that I try to reinforce throughout the podcast and in my general approach to teaching Buddhist concepts. So a little bit about this topic. What moves us? Um, So the idea for this podcast episode started with an email I received from a podcast listener. And I receive emails... um, regularly with ideas for podcast episodes and this specific um, listener asked for um, a podcast episode addressing the topic of rejection and you know with a little bit of of context and understanding a little bit about uh, the idea of rejection I thought you know that's a really powerful topic because at some uh, to some degree all of us fear rejection we all know um what it feels like to not be the one picked uh, to be on the team or to not have uh, the approval of parents or uh, siblings or friends. You know, to some degree, everyone has experienced some form of rejection, and I think all of us fear it. And and, and there's a reason why. I think we're hardwired um, as social creatures to really fear rejection. Uh, So when I saw this email and I was thinking about the topic of rejection, I thought, well, it might be interesting to um, combine a little bit of uh, Buddhism with what psychology teaches, at least the, uh, some of the, the, the findings in psychology and social uh, behavior about what moves us, what motivates us. So I came across this book by Susan Fisk called Social Beings, Core Motives in Social Psychology. Uh, Now, Susan is a professor of psychology at Princeton University, and she's known for her work on social cognition, also work on stereotypes and prejudice. But social cognition is kind of the the overall topic of this book, um, social beings. And it's a really fascinating thing. And the topic of psychology uh, has always been interesting to me. Um, I think it's what one of the things that... um, drove me to study Buddhism as Buddhism is, is a, a philosophy that delves into this topic of understanding yourself. Why do I think the things that I think and say the things that I say and do the things that I do and so on? Uh, so it ties really well with what we're finding in uh, psychology. So that's where the, the topic for this podcast episode, what moves us, what are the, I wanted to present to you what the five core social motives are according to uh, Susan Fisk. So I'm going to jump into this a little bit. Um, According to Fisk, core social motives uh, are fundamental underlying psychological processes that impel people's thinking. Uh, It it motivates or it's underlying uh, the way we think, we feel, and behave in uh, situations that involve other people. So the specific core motives described by Fisk are, uh, they can, there, you can memorize these with an acronym bucket, but bucket without a K it's B U C, uh, bucket B U C E T. And so these are the five core motives. The first one is belonging. The second one is understanding. Third is controlling. Um, fourth is enhancing self. And the fifth one is trusting. So you can see that acronym bucket in there. Um, And all five motives orient toward making people fit better into groups, thus increasing their chances for survival. Now, this is where the evolutionary psychology part of it comes in. Like I mentioned before, it's like we're hardwired um, to fear rejection, uh, to avoid it at all costs. And this fits in with the work that Susan Fisk has done Um, with uh, kind of bringing to light these core social motives that that govern everything that we do. So I want to talk about these a little bit, and then I want to correlate them a little bit with with some Buddhist teachings and Buddhist concepts. Uh, So the first one is belonging. And 
This is uh, belonging is the root need. It's the essential core social motive that um, uh, the others are said to be in service to this core motive, uh, facilitating or making possible um, the way that we function in social groups. So this first one is the most important one, belonging. And this is what came to mind when I was reading that email about rejection. You know, the opposite of rejection is belonging. And that happens to be the core social motive that Susan Fisk talks about in her book. So I thought it would be a, a, a neat way to approach the topic of rejection by talking about uh, belonging. Why do we f have this intense longing for belonging? So according to Fisk, the uh, belonging is the idea that people need strong, stable relationships with other people. And belonging to a group helps individuals to survive psychologically and physically. Now we know this from an evolutionary standpoint that at some point in time uh, our, our survival was literally dependent on whether or not we were able to belong with a group. Uh, individuals uh, had a much less uh, likely chance of survival out in the wild than if they were in a cohesive group like a tribe um, so think about this for a second from an evolutionary standpoint that uh, we're hardwired to want to fit in. We can't help it. Uh, we can't help it that we fear rejection, whether it be ind individual rejection from someone that we uh, care about, someone that we like, um, or uh, rejection on a, on a bigger scale with a group. Um, and you can see, you can see this uh, longing, this the sense for belonging, how it can influence the way that we want to uh, fit in with a with a, a group, a, a political group, a political ideology, a religious group, or beliefs that we might hold. You know, think about that in terms of this core motive of of wanting to belong. So there's the first one, right? Belonging. Uh, the second one is understanding. Um, understanding is the motivation uh, of individuals to understand their environment, to predict what's going to happen uh, in case of uncertainties and to make sense of, of what doesn't happen. So we're not very good at sitting with uncertainty. And this is, I, I've alluded to this before, I think this is why at some point in the past I can imagine that when the first volcano started erupting, a group somewhere uh, wasn't wasn't content with not knowing what was happening. So they decided, oh, uh, the gods must be angry and we need to cut people's heads off, right? Th that's why would why would we draw faulty conclusions to what we don't know? Because we're so uncomfortable with uncertainty. It's It's a core, one of the core social motives is to understand, to make sense of things. Um, and that can be a good thing, but the downside to that is often we find ourselves as, as individuals or as groups, as society, as a species, um, assigning meaning to things that don't have any meaning. And that can, get, that, that can create problems, like the example I gave with a volcano. So those are the first two, belonging, understanding. Now the third one is controlling. Um, and according to Fisk, this encourages people to feel effective in dealing with their social environment and themselves. Control entails a relationship between what people do and what they get. Um, now, what comes to mind for me is uh, with controlling is that we're playing life as if it were a game of chess. And we're thinking that the, the illusion of control is that if we could just be smart enough and figure this out, we can, you know, we can do a checkmate on life. And the reality, like I've mentioned many times, is that life is a lot more like a game of Tetris. So the, this need for us to control that is projected to an external thing, like I need to control um, you or I control my spouse or control my kids or control my work, control, there's anything, right? There's the world that we live in, we're trying to control. Um, I think where, where Buddhism comes in as an effective tool here is saying this need to control can be turned inward. It can be uh, projected towards yourself. It's like, why do you want to control the world if you, if you can't 
sit and 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 just be with whatever you're experiencing so this sense of control uh, that is a, a core social motive a need that we have we can still have but turn the the focus inward rather than outward um, so I'll, I'll talk about that in in a minute i want to move on to the next one so the fourth one is enhancing self what does that mean to enhance enhancing self well according to fisk this is this involves either maintaining self-esteem or being motivated by the possibility of self-improvement now remember all of these uh, tie back to the the first one which is belonging and you can see how this sense of enhancing self uh, to me correlates very closely with the with the first one it's um it's wanting to prove myself worthy of belonging. So I'm going to do whatever I think you think uh, I need to do to prove myself worthy to belong with you, you as the group, right? I'm just talking collectively here. Um, and this is a need that we have. It's a need that arises naturally in us to want to um, enhance ourselves to the point where we no longer have this fear of or doubt of not being worthy to belong and you can see how that could be affected tremendously um, when coupled with societal views societal norms religious views and religious norms um, you can see how that starts to play a role uh, so this this is kind of uh, countered in the buddhist concept of of buddha nature which is uh, the understanding that people are basically um, inherently good you know our our natural tendency uh, I don't know if good is the right word I, I want to be careful with with how I word that but our natural tendency is to want to be kind to want to uh, end or minimize the suffering that we see in others right you see a, a wounded puppy crossing the road most people granted not everyone but most people this is their natural tendency to want to help to minimize suffering um, most people can feel empathy if you're telling them uh, a story and you become emotional and you're crying most people will tend to empathize and feel those same emotions that is kind of the natural the natural position where uh, according to the buddhist worldview you know that's like the baseline and if that gets muddied up with with concepts and beliefs and ideas uh, that can become um, difficult to uh, see as the natural position because because it we become blinded to it. And a, a good example of this would be racism, right? It's it's not a natural thing that you're born with. It's a concept that you develop or you acquire through um, conditioning, men, uh, cognitive conditioning. So this can be taught to you, um, whether it be through religious ideology or societal views. You can be taught to be racist, um, but that's not a natural thing. So I'm correlating that to this concept of enhancing self. Uh, the, the Buddhist approach would say, what is there to enhance? If, if anything, we want to uncover, like I mentioned in a previous podcast episode, we want to peel back the, the layers of clay that are preventing us from seeing that inherent nature of, of kindness and compassion. Uh, the fifth one is trusting. And this is, according to Fisk, uh, this is, quote, seeing the world as a benevolent place. And again, you can see why this is so important for us to want to um, perceive that the world is a, is, a, in, is a good place, because what would it be like to live without a sense of trust? You know, we would be on edge all the time. And, and we see this in societies where there's a lot of fear, uh, there's not a lot of trust. Um, other things start breaking down pretty quickly. So one of the things that motivates us, according to, to, to all of this work, is um, to want to be able to trust, to, to want to see the world as a benevolent place. So when we start to look at these five core social motives in the context of, or, or through the lens of impermanence and interdependence, which is kind of the Buddhist way of trying to understand things, um, it can be... It can be a, a powerful way of understanding ourselves. Now, just as an example, again, going back to belonging, if belonging is the core social motive of all of these, all of these tie into that one, belonging, um, 
the fear of rejection, um, we can start to see in ourselves a, a lot of the, the decisions that we make, the things that we say and the things that we think and correlate them to this core social motive to want to belong. Or the flip side of the same coin is the fear of, of rejection. And this is why I wanted to, to present it this way, because the fear of rejection is, is not really any different than the desire to belong. It's, a, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. And I think almost everything that we do in our lives is motivated by one, one, one or the other side of that coin. We're, we're trying to belong or we're trying to avoid uh, not belonging. We're trying to avoid rejection whether that be in personal relationships or in group relationships. Um, for me, it's been fascinating to sit and, and, and analyze my own um, actions and words and thoughts and to, and to think of it with this lens of, am I, why am I doing this? What, where do I see, oh, there's this core motive inside me that I'm just trying to belong or I'm trying um, to not be rejected, to not risk um, being rejected. Now, again, I bring this up because like I said, we're hardwired this way. It's not like, it's not like we can just not be this way. Uh, we'd be going against millions of years of evolution here. Um, so, um, rather than thinking, okay, if this is how things are, I need to, um, you know, I need to make sure that I don't think this way anymore or feel this way anymore. Uh, we want to approach this a little bit uh, uh, from a different angle. So earlier this week, I posted my thoughts on the heart of mindfulness practice. And I think this correlates with what we've been talking about with what moves us. Um, everything we perceive with our senses, sounds, sights, tastes, smells, physical sensations, and then of course thoughts, especially thoughts, uh, gives rise to feelings about those perceptions. So for example, we end up liking or disliking the experience. We feel comfort or discomfort about what we're perceiving. Uh, if we like what we see, for example, we keep looking at it. If we don't like what we see, we close our eyes or we turn away. If we're talking about taste and we, we taste something that we like, then we want more of it. If we don't like it, we're going to probably spit it out or, or never taste that again. Um, we do this with thoughts. We cling to the comfortable thoughts and we feel emotional distress about the uncomfortable thoughts. And this is the process that we go through with all of our perceptions. So craving and aversion, right? We're craving after some uh, of these perceptions and uh, aversion towards others. We're pushing and pulling. We're liking and disliking. And the heart of mindfulness practice is to first see and recognize our tendency to pull toward or push away from these feelings. And second, instead of reacting out of habit to these feelings, try to remain steady with the feeling that arises. Now, the benefit of practicing this is that we can become more adept at placing a gap between the direct experience and our reaction to the feeling that arises from the experience. Um, so if we were to correlate this with the uh, five core social motives, what we're trying to understand here is, okay, well, if I understand that this is the nature of what motivates me and how I work, the goal here isn't to change it. Okay, well, I'm going to rewire myself. That's not going to work. The goal here is that uh, mindfulness practice is not about changing the feeling that arises. It's not about changing the nature of how things are, but instead understanding the relationship we have with the feelings that arise. Now, this is a, a critical understanding because when I, when I understand what motivates me in the context of at least these five core social motives, um, for me, it's helpful to know okay, oh, this is why I felt this way, or this is why I said this, this is why I uh, reacted the way that I did. And we just see it, and, and that starts to change the relationship that we have with it. Uh, it's not about changing the thing itself. Um, so as a, a, a quick example, so last week I went down to 
um, Mexico to my 20 year high school reunion. And it was fun getting together with everyone. Um, but I had this experience that I, I want to share quick, quickly with you because one of the things I kind of struggled with in high school, uh, about halfway through, uh, being a twin was, uh, I, I started to have this feeling that, you know, most of my friends aren't really my friends. There are friends. Uh, they're only friends with me because they're friends with my brother. And, and I had this perception that my brother is the funny one. He's the, um, he's the one everyone likes. And, and I'm just the sidekick. I'm the one that's kind of stuck there because I'm the twin. Um, and people, some people had uh, ways of identifying us in, in a joking way that aggravated this problem for me. They'd always call me the serious one and him the fun one. And, and this was evident in, in the nicknames that we were given. And I started to really struggle with this concept. Um, and, and I can see now, right, as I study psychology or as I study concepts from, from Buddhism, and I see these core social motives, and I see this first one, belonging or the fear of rejection, I, I see this uh, very evident in my own life, in my past. And I had this, this fear that without my brother, I'd be totally rejected. I wouldn't belong with this group because what makes me belong to the group is that I'm attached to him. And that was very threatening for me. And that caused a slight rift in, in, in the last year of high school between my brother and I because I needed to kind of go out and find out who I was. What happens? You know, can, Am I capable of having my own friends on my own without him? Those were things that I was trying to explore in my uh, final year of high school. And like I said, it caused a, a little rift between my brother and I for a while. Um, well, all of this, I, I'm bringing this up because all of this resurfaced last week when we were back down there. Um, you know, after high school, we moved away to seven different countries. We, we, we were in the U S um, and that life essentially ended 20 years ago. So we go back last week and it's like, we, we stepped back in time. With a lot of these friends we hadn't seen since high school and the the relationship and the engagement that they had with us um, was from that time from 20 years ago they had no reference of uh, of who my brother is now or who I am now or how I am um, so I was working with the me from back then 20 years ago and as we as we got there a couple days before the reunion you know, we're starting to make plans and trying to see our old friends. And I would text someone and say, hey, we're going to be doing this or that. Where are we going to see you? And they'd be like, oh, I already texted your brother and made plans. And, and this the first time I didn't think anything of it. And then the second half, the second time I was like, oh, and then the third time, third separate friend, you know, the third friend that made it very clear that nobody was talking to me. They're all communicating with my twin brother to make the plans of where we're meeting and when and at what time. All of a sudden, all of these emotions flooded back in from high school. And and I realized this is that fear of rejection. It's the fear that uh, I'm not good enough. You know, I, how, how do I prove myself worthy of these friendships? Because I'm just the sidekick that's here uh, along for the ride. All these feelings welled up again, just like from high school. And it was really funny. But this time, unlike then, I knew what was happening. I, I knew... Um, I understand the core social motives. I, I see the world differently now. I, uh, through the context of uh, a lot of these teachings that come from Buddhism and from psychology. So the experience was different. The feelings were the same. I want to be clear about that. The feelings of fear of rejection were just as real as they were back then. Uh, the, the, the strong desire I was feeling to want to belong. I felt like I didn't belong and I just wanted more than anything to be a part of the group. Um, all of those feelings were very real, just like they were when I first felt them. What was different this time was the relationship that I had to those feelings. As they uh, surfaced, I was able to look at them and in a, almost in a way smile and think, huh, I know where this is coming from. I know why I'm feeling this. I know what uh, some of the causes and conditions are that give rise to these feelings. Now that alone, that understanding alone changed the situation. I didn't take anything personally. I didn't feel 
uh, down and out. I just thought, oh, how interesting. And I reminded myself, well, with the, di the dynamics that we're working with are the dynamics from 20 years ago. It's like we, you know, we went to this book that's 20 years old and we just turned the page of what would have been next 20 years ago that next day had we stayed there. And I thought, well, in that context, of course, they would all be working with him because back then he was the one, you know, that was the very issue I was dealing with. He's the, he was the point of contact for us. And I always just fell in line as, okay, well, I'm, I'm the other one. I'm the extra here. <laughs> um, so it was, it was very interesting to go through that experience this time around with, a, with an entirely different relationship to the feelings. But like I said before, the feelings were the same, the exact same. Um, but it was a fascinating thing. And, and it made me feel really grateful for the time and the dedication that I've spent to trying to understand myself, to trying to um, have a more clear picture of the reality of of why I think the things that I think and do the things that I do and say the things that I say. And that comes, that's, that's the heart of mindfulness practice. Uh, and there I saw it in action as I'm at my 20 year high school reunion, having an entirely different relationship to the feelings, but experiencing the very same feelings that was fascinating for me. And I was very grateful for uh, knowing this time around, ha having a better understanding because there was no need to be reactive. There was no, um, there's nothing to react to. What I was doing was just watching and seeing what would arise and allowing it to be valid, thinking, oh, I know why I feel this way. And it's a totally valid point of view, a totally valid feeling to have that fear of rejection or that longing to belong. Um, and I just watched it for what it was. So what, what I hope to convey in this podcast episode is that the heart of mindfulness practice and applied to what moves us when you understand the core social motives of belonging, understanding, controlling, enhancing yourself, and, and, and trusting. Um, as, you, as you understand with greater clarity the nature of how you are, and notice I say how you are, not who you are, um, you'll be more skillful with, um, with how you relate to the feelings that you have, the thoughts that you have, the emotions that you have. That's what this is about. And that's what I would say um, to the person who reached out in the email about this topic of rejection is, well, yeah, it, rejection is a very real thing. And we feel it when the causes and conditions arise that allow that fear of rejection to be there, just like I experienced last week. It will arise, um, you know, if you've ever been betrayed by someone, anything that triggers that feeling. If you had uh, um, issues growing up with the way that your parents treated you or siblings, like there are so many ways that this fear of rejection can arise and can be triggered over and over and over throughout your life. It does for me, and I'm sure it, it, it does for all of you listening at some point in, in some arena or aspect of your life, it's natural because we're hardwired to want to belong. And the flip side of that is that we're hardwired to fear rejection like it's the, the scariest thing on earth. Because at one point it was, it was literally a matter of life and death. Um, so we work with that. It, it's, it's almost instinctual how it comes up. And when it does, rather than then writing the, the chain of reactivity, we can pause and say, oh, okay, I know why this feels this way. Now, now what do I do next? How do I handle this situation skillfully rather than um, the habitual reactivity that may have uh, taken me down some other path I didn't want to be on? Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about. What moves us? The five core social motives. If you want to learn more about this concept, I highly recommend um, Susan Fisk's book, um, the book is called Social Beings, Core Motives and Social Psychology. Now, if you're into psycho psychology, this will be an interesting book. Otherwise, it may be a pretty boring book. And, and you may have just gotten in this podcast episode the summary that you would have wanted out of the book. So um, but if you do want to go more in depth, check that book out. Social Beings, Core Motives and Social Psychology. Um, now, if you're a regular listener to the podcast, I've got a you know, I've got to plug my book here. Uh, you're probably interested in, in all of the essential concepts of Buddhism and how they relate to your daily life. 
Well, in my newest book, No Nonsense Buddhism for Beginners, you'll gain a, a fundamental understanding of Buddhism and how to apply the philosophies in, in your everyday life. And those of you who have read it know this book is a question and answer format. It's, uh, it's written in a way to be uh, very easy to understand these concepts and these teachings and the practices and the history. Um, so if you're interested in that, check it out. You can learn more about that book on everydaybuddhism.com. And like always, if you've enjoyed this podcast episode, uh, please share it with others, write a review, give it a rating in iTunes. Um, you can always join our online community to continue these discussions online. Uh, go to secularbuddhism.com forward slash community to get links to our Facebook pages. And if you want to make a donation to support the work I'm doing with the podcast, you can visit secularbuddhism.com and click on the donate button. And that's all I have for now, but I look forward to recording another podcast episode soon. Thank you for listening. Until next time. <laughs>